History has indeed been rewritten by those more Catholics than not. Yeah. It's still possible to know and to find out what true Christianity was all about and what constituted a New Testament church. That's basically what this study is all about, and it is about church history. Now, probably in the next uh, presentation, four or five, I'm going to start including a little bit more. I'm not trying to take away from Dr. Carroll's work, but I want to add some things to it. I want to elaborate a little bit and add to what he has already done. I'm not downing his work, not at all, don't get me wrong. But there are some other things that I would like us to look at in connection with this as we are going through it. And what I'm going to do, starting in either presentation 4 or 5, will be go to the first two or three chapters of the book of Revelation and look at those seven churches of Asia. Because those, to me, they fit into what Dr. Carroll is, is, is writing about. Those seven churches of Asia were representations of typical churches in different periods, be that as it may. Those were seven actual churches, and they did exist during this period of time that Dr. Carroll is, is, is writing about. But there are some characteristics of churches that have, true churches have picked up, shall we say, down through the ages. And I think it would be good for us to look at those as we go along as well. So that's coming. And I, I usually add things too, when even, <laughs> not that the work that I'm, I'm, I'm using is bad, not at all. This is an excellent work. In any, in any one work, there's only so much that you can cover. And so what I like to do is I like to add to it and to elaborate more and put some more into it, make it maybe more interesting to us and some more things that uh, we know have happened down through the centuries. So that's coming. Uh, and in fact, even today, I've got a little bit of added to that you, you may not have seen before. So this is the, the Trail of Blood presentation number three. In its religion, the Roman Empire at that time was pagan. A religion of many gods, some material and some imaginary. There were many devout believers and worshipers. It was a religion not simply of the people, but of the empire. It was an established religion. It was established by law and supported by the government. There you found in one church history that was written by Moshe in volume one in chapter one. So we want to look at ancient Rome and religion for just a minute. This, this is part of what I have added to it. I, I don't give my references here. I could, I should, but I didn't, didn't think about it, and I'd already moved on, and then I could go back and find it, but that's okay. Religion played a very important part in the daily life of ancient Rome and the Romans. The Roman religion was centered around gods, and explanation for events usually involved gods in some way or another. The Romans believed that gods control their lives and as a result they spend a great deal of their time worshiping them now this in itself is not bad is it i mean we we should be like that to the true and living god the problem here is that they have false gods god never did say that he was the only one he said that he was the true and living god all the other gods, of course, we know are not true gods. But even, even gods can become figments of our imagination or ideals or ideas or anything that would come between us and the true and living God actually becomes our God. And it could be your house. It could be anything material. It could even be your children or spouse or, or some other individual, uh, which, which was... A great part of the Roman religion, but not just the Romans, the Greeks, and, and the Babylonians, and all before them. 
God's played a very important part in their lives. The most important God was Jupiter. Uh, he was the head honcho. All right, he was the head god. He was the king of the gods, king of gods who ruled with his wife Juno, the goddess of the sky. Here's a list of some other gods that they had. These are just a few. Mars, god of war. Mercury, messenger of the gods. You know, he, he's the one that has the, the helmet over the wings on it, you know, and the boots with the wings. Neptune, that's the way it, it came across Neptune. I think we've seen most of this time as Neptune, god of the sea. Janus, god of the doorway. Diana, goddess of hunting. Vesta, goddess of the hurt. I really don't know what this means now. Minerva, goddess of healing and wisdom. And Venus, goddess of love. To be honest, these are the major ones. But these are just part. There are quite a few more. I'm going to get into all of those. But there were even more gods that they worshipped from time to time. After the reign of the Emperor Augustus in 27 BC to AD 14, the emperor was also to be considered a god and he was worshipped on special occasions. You understand, this helps us more to understand why that the Roman Empire began to turn so hard against the Christians because they would not worship the emperor. They would not worship Caesar. And they would not bow down to him. Well, that was treason. In the Roman Empire, that was treason. If you did not worship Caesar and consider him to be a god, one of the many gods, then that was, that was treason. Each of these gods had a special festival day, which was usually a public holiday. This holiday gave people the opportunity to visit the temple for whatever god was being celebrated. And at this temple, priests would sacrifice animals and offer them to the god. That doesn't sound a great deal different than what the Jews were doing, does it? Except a multiplicity. What do you think is the pattern there? I don't know. Sacrificial animals were offered down through the history of mankind. But it seems that God started it as a picture of Jesus who would come as the Lamb of God to be offered for the sins of mankind. There were qualifications for those animals. The sacrifices, the animal sacrifices to these other gods did not have such qualifications. You will find in almost every culture and civilization, there is some type of sacrifice that is given, that is offered to whatever gods that are being worshipped. There's always a sacrifice given. Temples to worship the gods are built throughout the Roman Empire. Temples usually followed the same building pattern. The roof was triangular shaped and supported by great pillars. Steps led up to the main doorway, which was usually built behind the pillars. If you can imagine in Athens, Greece, the Parthenon is a good example of how temples were built. Now I realize that was in Greece. But if you, if you look, you'll find that the temples that the Greeks built to their gods was not a great deal different than the temples that the Romans built to their gods. Romans are probably the copycats because the Greeks came first. <laughs> the inside of the temple would have been very well decorated. and There would have been a statue of the god in it. I never did go in one, but when I was in Vietnam, a buddy of mine, and I have a picture somewhere, I think it's in all of the slides that I took, and someday maybe I'll get those transferred over from slides to something else before they get too bad. It's been so many years now, but standing outside a Buddhist temple, we never did go in it, but inside of all of these temples scattered out through the Far East, you would find a statue of Buddha in there. And they would offer their sacrifices to Buddha in that temple. Now, I don't know whether we'd gotten in trouble if we went in there or not, but we never did try. The, the Asians also have ancestor worship, which is very predominant throughout the Far East. 
In other words, they will worship their ancestors, their forefathers. I never will forget when I was in Vietnam, they had chapel on base on Sunday morning. And there was a Southern Baptist church that was in Saigon. A Southern Baptist missionary was, was there. And Sunday evening, I would go off base and go into Saigon, and I would go to this church on Sunday evening when I, when I could. I wasn't always able to go. Sometimes I had to work. But I never will forget one time, one Sunday evening, during a testimony time, this young Vietnamese lady stood, and someone translated for her. And I never will forget. She said, I will be glad when my grandmother dies then I will be able to accept Jesus Christ as my Savior. The ancestor worship was so ingrained in those people, and this young lady especially, that she felt she could not turn away from her grandmother until she died. Then and only then could she accept Jesus Christ as her Savior. I have no idea whatever happened to that young lady. And in fact, I have no idea what happened to those Vietnamese Christians when South Vietnam finally fell to the North Vietnamese. Sacrifices were made just as they, they were here. There would have been also an altar where a priest would have served the God and made sacrifices. People called augurs could also be found in the temples. These people used the entrails of the dead animals to predict the future. The Romans took these predictions very seriously, and few ignored the advice of an augur. What control they had over these people. Now, Teresa just mentioned that many would have their, their own altars and gods, right, in, in, in their homes. Each family home would also have a small altar and shrine. The Romans had personal household gods or spirits called lairs which were worshipped every day at home. I told you before, they worshipped a lot more than just those gods that we had listed a while ago. The shrine contained statues of the lairs and the head of the household led family prayers around the shrine each day. One thing you can do is appreciate the dedication to their gods. The service was considered so important that family slaves were also invited. It is believed that most Romans were more keen to please their layers than the public gods such as Jupiter. Now, this is, all of you remember Pompeii. This is a family shrine, a picture of a family shrine in a house in Pompeii. And you know that that volcano erupted so quickly that there are amazing architecture and archaeology things there. It's just, it's just amazing how that it's been preserved because of the, the results of that Vesuvius. So this is, this is an example of a, a family shrine. And of course, Pompeii where it was Roman. Back on Dr. Uh, Dr. Carroll's text, the Jewish people at that period, no longer a separate nation, were scattered throughout the Roman Empire. They yet had their temple in Jerusalem, and the Jews yet went there to worship, and they were yet jealous of their religion. But it, like the pagan, had long drifted into formalism and lost its power. This was typical of the Jews happening time and time again, over and over and over. That's what the period of the Judges was all about. The religion of Christ being a religion not of this world, its founder gave it no earthly head and no temporal power. Romans couldn't understand this. It sought no establishment, no state or governmental support. In fact, the Jews couldn't understand it either, for that matter. It sought no dethronement of Caesar, said its author, Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. Being a spiritual religion, it was a rival of no earthly government. They thought it was, but it wasn't. 
Its adherents, however, were taught to respect all civil law and government. Now let's look at these verses. Romans chapter 13, verses 1 through 7. Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Do you realize what that verse says, what Paul is saying? God has allowed powers to be established, authorities to be established. And we are to be obedient to those unless it goes against what God laid down in his word. Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. That is, if the power is good. The Bible also addresses when a power is evil in, in other places. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore, you must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience' sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also, for they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. Render therefore to all their dues, tribute to whom tribute is due, custom to whom custom, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Titus chapter 3, verse 1. Put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For it is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Dr. Carroll continues, I want now to call your attention to some of the landmarks or earmarks of this religion, the Christian religion. If you and I are to trace it down through 20 long centuries, and especially down through 1,200 years of midnight darkness, darkened by rivers and seas of martyr blood, then we would need to know well these marks. They will be many times terribly disfigured, but there will always be some indelible mark. But let us carefully and prayerfully Beware, we will encounter many shams and make-believes. If possible, the very elect will be betrayed and deceived. We want, if possible, to trace it down through credible history, but more especially through the unerring, infallible words and marks of divine truth. Now let's look at some of these unerring and infallible marks. If in going down through the centuries we run upon a group or groups of people bearing not these distinguishing marks and teaching other things for fundamental doctrines, let us beware. Number one, Christ, the author of this religion, organized his followers or disciples into a church and the disciples were to organize other churches as this religion spread and other disciples were made this organization or church according to the scriptures and according to the practice of the apostles and the early churches was given two kinds of offices and only two pastors and deacons the pastor was called 
bishop. Both pastor and deacons to be selected by the church and to be servants of the church. Number three. The churches and their government and discipline to be entirely separate and independent of each other. Jerusalem to have no authority over Antioch, nor Antioch over Ephesus, nor Ephesus over Corinth, and so forth. And their government was to be congregational, democratic. A government of the people, by the people, and for the people. That's supposedly the way that our country was at one time, no longer. Number four, mark number four, to the church were given two ordinances and only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. These to be perpetual and memorial. Some want to add foot washing in there. Some would say, Foot washing would be there because it was done on the night that Jesus established the Lord's Supper. I'm here to tell you it was not. That was not the same night. And I can prove it. I used to think it was on the same night, but it's not. After a closer examination of the scriptures, I can prove that it was not on the same night. But that's another lesson within itself. Only the saved were to be received as members of the church. Acts 2, 47. Those saved ones to be saved by grace alone, without any works of the law. Ephesians 2, 5, 8, and 9. I'm not putting these in here. You know them well yourself already. These saved ones and they only to be immersed in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. Matthew 28, 19. And only those thus received and baptized to partake of the Lord's Supper. And the Supper to be celebrated only by the church in church capacity. I can also prove that it wasn't just the twelve apostles that was at that Passover Supper. And the establishing of the Lord's Supper. The majority of the 120 were there. Several reasons why. That's another lesson within itself, too. <laughs> Number six, the inspired scriptures, and they only, in fact, the New Testament, and that only to be the rule and guide of faith and life. Not only for the church as an organization, but for each individual member of that organization. Number seven, Christ Jesus, the founder of this organization and the savior of its members, to be their only priest and king, their only Lord and lawgiver, and the only head of the churches. The churches to be executive only in carrying out their Lord's will and completed laws, never legislative to amend or abrogate old laws or to make new ones. Catholic Church did. Number eight, this religion of Christ was to be individual, personal, and purely voluntary or through persuasion. No physical or governmental compulsion such as Islam. A matter of distinct individual and personal choice. Choose you is the scriptural injunction. It could neither be accepted nor rejected nor lived by proxy nor under compulsion. Mark well that neither Christ nor his apostles ever gave to his followers what is known today as a denominational name such as Catholic, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Episcopal, and so forth, unless the name given by Christ to John was intended for such, the Baptist, John the Baptist. In Matthew 11, 11 or 10 or 12 other times, more than just once, by the way, Christ called the individual follower disciple. Two or more were disciples. The organization of disciples, whether at Jerusalem or Antioch or elsewhere, was called church. 
You'll note in the New Testament, you'll find that the church at Rome, the church at Antioch, the church at Jerusalem, the church at so-and-so. When we were in Jamaica, we didn't, and I, you can tell me the names of the churches now, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't know what to tell you. I wouldn't know them. We went by where they were located. For instance, the church, the one church that we worked with outside of Santa Cruz in St. Elizabeth Parish was in a district called Burnt Ground. We, we would just say, I'm going to Burnt Ground today. We're going to be at Church of Burnt Ground today. We knew what we were talking about. Okay. Others might not, but we knew. We knew. Or Roses Valley. I have still get that, that, and I went to that church probably more than any of the others, and I'm still not sure about the, the official name of that church. <clears throat> we just called it Roses Valley. And it's not in a valley. Way up on top of a mountain, you have to go through Roses Valley to get there. <laughs> but Roses Valley does show up on, on the Google Earth, too. <laughs> If more than one of these separate organizations were referred to, they were called churches. The word church in the singular was never used when referring to more than one of these organizations. Nor even when referring to them all. I venture to give one more distinguishing mark, Dr. Kerr writes. We will call it Complete separation of church and state. No combination, no mixture of this spiritual religion with a temporal power. Religious liberty for everybody. And what they're calling well, separation of church and state is not what our forefathers defined it as. It's being defined today as church has nothing to do with government. No, that's the opposite of what the our, our, our national forefathers intended. Government was not to be involved in church. There was not to be a government church. Even though almost, it almost happened here. If you study our early history, it almost happened. It's been said that Thomas Jefferson observed a Baptist church business meeting. And from that got the ideas how to set up a government. I don't know whether that's true or not, but if you if you if you look at it and you examine it, it makes sense. It makes sense. Well, that's what we have for today. Then presentation number four, we'll begin examining the chart that Dr. Carroll has in detail. And that's when I may be. I, I don't remember exactly at what point, four or five, that I will bring in uh, some other materials for us to look at.